uh, a point of discussion that we're all talking about across the state. So we talked about a lot of different wraparound services, but we also talked about providers and partners that we have across the state who could help us in receiving these services. We talked about local school districts, but what became clear is that school districts do not have the local funding to pull this off. Uh, as a matter of fact, over the last uh, few months of presentations, we heard from a school district that used multiple funding sources to be able to pull this off, whether it was funding sources that came from their county commissioners, from federal programs, from local funds, but really pulling it all together to make it happen. And so that became a point of discussion. We also, again, talked with our health departments across the state and departments of social services. We know that our faith-based organizations in our communities are providing services as well. We know that the community college is represented today, but they were one of our partners. Um, and then we talked about some nonprofit organizations as well. Uh, food banks, Boys and Girls Club, the Lions Club, the Rotary Club, communities and schools, um, all groups that are working in communities to provide those services for students. So what we have come to at this point is that we have had a coordinated school health program in the state for a very, very long time. So our discussion really started around how do we weave that work into the whole school, whole community, whole child model. And in a few minutes, I'm going to share with you examples from four other states who are doing this work as well and taking a very similar approach to the way we have, have taken here in the state of North Carolina to start off by looking at the coordinated school health model that we've had for many years and then working to weave the, this whole child framework into that model. So we know it's about investing in our children, and this is a slide that we uh, show quite often because it centers us around why we are here each and every day doing this work. And, and I had to include in the presentation that in order for us to move forward with this work, we had to evaluate the current work that we were doing here in the department to be able to pull this off. Um, and so many of the folks who will come before you today were part of that review of what's going on here at the department. We looked at our healthy active children's policy, which is a big part of our coordinated school health work, um, because we know that falls into one of the 10 components of the whole child model. Um, we also took some time to put side to side what would it look like to compare that coordinated uh, school health model with that whole school, whole community, whole child model going from eight areas to 10 areas, taking a look at members of school health councils across the state, members who are school champions, are assigned by the, super, uh, the local school district superintendent to be maybe a little more intentional about pulling in community representatives and decision makers to this discussion, which is why many of you are here today. You've been with us for almost a year. We also looked at resources provided for the different activities to really professional development. And I think that Dr. Essek will talk some about the professional development that has been offered to school districts who are in our first pilot of the whole child model. And making good data-driven decisions. So we looked at different data points when we were here a few months ago. We looked at things from the teacher working condition survey. We looked at some of the school health reports. We looked at some of the LEA um, health advisory reports and started to look at data points that would fit into that whole child model. Today, as you hear from our two school districts, you will see that a big focus of their work is about looking at their data because every school or school district is different and so it's about what is the need in that school or district based on the whole child model. But this is an example of some of the data we reviewed over the last few months. This is another way of looking at the data. We did some comparison work looking at maybe a state average in certain areas 
and then what certain school districts might have, like a great example is the nurse to student ratio. That's something we talk about a lot. Um, what is the average across the state and what might be happening in certain school districts in that area. So it's a different way of looking at data. So data-driven prevention plus data responsiveness and problem solving will get, get us to a better environment for our students. Um, and so we started to think about internal infrastructure and sustainability for this work, uh, dedicating staff to this work. Um, and I think that Dr. Essick is gonna talk a little bit about how her staff have organized to be able to support the pilot districts. We talked about the improvement and collaboration with our public health partners and the education sector, um, including health indicators um, as part of the review process, improving and increasing school health policies, practices, and assessments. We're also helping our pilot districts do that work. And then, of course, looking at our school health advisory committees as an avenue to get a lot of this work done and local communities. So with all of that, we organized ourselves over the last few months to uh, bridge the gap. We asked who's in. We have 11 school districts who are in the first pilot and we're moving forward. And so some of the next steps that have occurred and are occurring would be to describe and introduce the model to our state's, uh, statewide local superintendents. We did that back in December of 2016. We are continuing to brand the whole Child NC work. Many of you are looking at an outstanding poster in front of you that we hope you take with you and you proudly post in, in your uh, place of work. And then we continue to seek data collections and partnership developments across the state in doing this work. We sought out our pilot districts. You'll hear from two of those today. We are producing needs assessment tools, um, and I think you'll hear a little bit more about that as well from our school districts. Uh, we're continuing to create an alignment rubric so we can certainly see what our, our charters and LEAs have in their communities and how that links up to state agencies across the state. And we're continuing to organize data Data is critically important to this model and also to planning in the future. So a lot of next steps, but a lot of it is underway. Determining the plausibility of offering this statewide, that is really going to be the next step for us. Hopefully when you return in the fall, we're gonna be able to start sharing some data around the 11 pilots and then maybe begin to make some recommendations to our state board in sharing the pilot data with the state board in the hopes of working towards uh, legislative recommendations that we may want to make regarding the model. So a lot of things ahead of us. Our state board approved this resolution in the fall. And we always like to look at it to remind ourselves of why we're doing this work. And so as we look at what other states are doing, um, there are many, many states, but today I've chosen to take a look at Florida, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Mississippi, who are all engaged in looking at the whole school, whole community, whole child model in their work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Florida, they have been using the coordinated school health model, but they agree that those eight components of that model need to be expanded, and they're including the ten. In the, in the circle, the 10 and the blue circle in the center. They're including those 10 components as they move forward. Also, they're using this as part of their Florida Healthy School District self-assessment tool. Just as we have considered tools that help school districts and organizations assess their ability to implement this model. So Florida is, is working hard at that. We have Kentucky, their Department of Education, they have put together a state level group as well uh, to align this model with their current coordinated school health initiative. And they have uh, formed that work group to also align their existing practices and policies with the framework. Um, so they're in a, a big alignment mode right now, looking at their current um, practices and policies and aligning the whole child model with it. 
Um, and again, they see this as a more modernized approach to that coordinated school health model, very much as, as we have done. And they are partnering with ASCD and CDC, the Center for Disease Control, in doing this work. And you'll see in a minute, we are partnering with the state ASCD here in North Carolina to do a similar activity. Uh, Louisiana actually has incorporated the whole child model into a piece of legislation uh, which is calling for the development of a, of a work group in their state as well um, to create an implementation plan for the model. Um, of course, their work group includes many of the same folks that we have on ours, uh, folks from the Department of Health and Hospitals, the Department of Education, uh, the Medicaid managed care organizations, and other experts on the whole child model are included in that work group. Um, and then the State Department of Education has created a map of all of the school-based health centers, their educational agencies with wellness councils, and other federally um, funded health programs that they have published statewide as part of this work. And uh, finally, this is not the final state doing this work, but it's the final state that I have to present today is Mississippi. They have an Office of Healthy Schools within their Department of Education as well. And they have released that model as part of what they call their Tools That Work, which is a guide to success in building a healthy school. And this has been pushed out to all of their uh, school districts. Um, it supports teachers and administrators in really working towards that Mississippi Healthy Students Act, which is very similar to the act that we have here in the state of North Carolina. So Mississippi's Office of Healthy Schools and their Department of Health have created a three-tier plan to implement their whole child model statewide. So I wanted you to know that it's not just a North Carolina thing. This is happening in many states across the country, and we're very excited about looking to those states and others as we move forward with this work. Any questions about other states? Do we know of him, who's been doing it the longest and have they seen any kind of impact or effect so far that they've been able to share? Well, the model's only been out since 2013-14. I mean, it was just created, so I don't know that anybody's done enough with this particular framework long enough to say what their successes are. But all of the states that, that uh, Dr. Peter Martin just mentioned were doing good coordinated school health work before they moved into this model. So. Thank you. That's a great question. So we'll continue to kind of monitor their progress uh, because I think that can certainly inform our work as well. Definitely. So before I turn it over to Dr. Essek, we just want to mention a couple of statewide highlights. Uh, Watauga County wanted to be here today to share that they had a State of the Child Forum back on May 5th. Um, where they brought in community members from all over the county to focus on wellness of children um, and the whole child model as well as uh, working with students from trauma was a big part of the content. It was a two-day event that brought folks together and at the end they had action planning groups brainstorm ideas for the entire community and then the steering committee is going to take all of those ideas and meet monthly to make those suggestions a reality. So we have communities across the state who are embracing the model and using it to guide discussions locally. So Watauga County wanted to ensure that we all knew about that event even though they could not be here to present it. Um, you all will have a copy of this PowerPoint and if you would like to know more, they do have a web page set up as well as um, a video that shows their opening, it shows the speakers that presented during their uh, opening convocation. But it was an excellent event that was attended by many, many people. Also, we wanted to share with you that uh, through the North Carolina School Boards Association, we will be doing a session, specifically Dr. Essek will be doing a session that has been requested by school board members across the state because they want to know more about this model and how they can make it a reality in their community. So the North Carolina School Boards Association will be having their summer leadership conference and that will be one of their focus areas. Also, North Carolina ASCD is um, 
having their annual fall conference and the theme this year is Whole Child for the Whole World Conference. And that is gonna be on October 31st in Durham. And so they will be inviting uh, school districts uh, from across the state, charter schools from across the state, to receive training from ASCD experts at the national level on this model. So we are very excited about them doing that. And we, we are also working with them to see if we can get um, some pretty significant discounts to our 11 pilot districts. So they can certainly have their folks attend and get trained as well. So Dr. Faison, we're gonna hopefully get you a good discounted rate there. So as you can see, we are connecting and connecting with folks across the state and making this model uh, real, um, really grow and prosper across the state. Maria, for those of us who do not know that acronym, please tell us what ASCD is. Yes, it's the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. Um, and actually, that at one time was the entire name of the organization, and at some point it just shifted to ASCD. So thank you for correct that. So we are excited. You've seen this quote before. I think we shared it at one of our first meetings. For too long, entities have talked about collaboration without taking the necessary steps. This model puts that process into action. And so here we are today. We've made a lot of progress, as Mr. Collins has stated. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Essek, whose team is helping us spearhead the pilot work across the state. Oh, okay. Well, Pete got you covered, which is really good. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for all you being here. I know it's a little hot, so if you need to take off a jacket, uh, that's certainly understandable. It's getting warmer uh, up here since this morning. It was full. <coughs> uh, so before we start and I tell you a little bit more about where the pilots are, I wanted to do, a, do an exercise with you. and. Uh, if you'll take a minute and go through, we're going to talk about two different LEAs, and then I'm going to ask you to weigh in on this a little bit. So LEA 1, they had higher rates of suspension due to lack of immunization. They received funding for a school nurse for two years to address the immunization requirements local or, from a local funding foundation. Um, their suspensions for failure to immunize dropped by 50%, and after two years, but after two years, the LEA couldn't afford to continue the position, and their suspension rates went back up. Okay. That's LEA 1. LEA 2 also had high rates of suspension due to lack of immunization. They convened a group of community stakeholders to develop a strategy for immunizations. They created a plan and began immunizing students in the summer. After two years, they saw a significant drop and suspensions, and that has continued to drop in the years following. What's different about those two LEAs? One is community driven. Well, I can say totally community driven. I'm sorry. One is the community is 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 a it's a group, and it's a community. It's not one person doing a job where extra funding needed to be. So this LEA two made everybody take ownership with the problem. That's how I see it. Okay. Sure. Anything else? Yeah, LEA one is doing it based on an HR decision and using funding as a, a backdrop for supporting it. Whereas LA two, to, to the latest point there, we all know the power of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece. Okay. Anything else? In all likelihood, LEA two took a systems approach, mm -hmm. whereas LEA one took a very programmatic. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, actually. LEA 2 is going to tell you about how they did that in a few minutes, but um, <laughs> because they're, they're here with us, but, but exactly, I mean, you get it very quickly. Look what happens. I mean, there's a, there's a big P policy in place that says that if students haven't been immunized by 30 days, there's a suspension there, and, and so that's what drove some of that, but then how we address that differs, and what we're working with with a lot of the pilots is to think about how to address that, because oftentimes we know that, that if there's a strong policy in place, that leads to good practice, but sometimes it works the other way too. Sometimes good practices start happening, and that leads to development of a policy. Every time I think about policy and practice, I have to look at Sally Herndon, 
because of how well tobacco policy has led to good practice and practice leads to good policy around around tobacco use. Um, I mean, look at our schools, they're all smoke free now. Uh, and in 1980 something, you could smoke on school property. So it's really changed a, a lot during that time. So what I'd like us to do for just a few minutes is to think about how that's worked for all of you. So I'd like you to pair with one or two, if that feels better, people near you. And I'd like you to think about one either policy that drove your practices and, and created a successful program or practices that you and your work have put into place that have led to an outcome of a, of a good solid policy. And when I say policy, it could be a real policy or it could be a set of procedures, if that fits better. Because sometimes we may not have a, a school district may not create a policy per se, but they may come up with a plan that includes a, a set of procedures that they'll follow from here on out. So, got the directions with me? Everybody will take just a few minutes and talk about that and I'll ask you to share. So think about things that you've been successful with in your work.
program in Burke County and we do a lot of research and development of programs and training but we also go into the homes and look at the families and we came to realize that parents were telling their, their teachers or staff about not having food for the weekend and not being able to access things that they needed and their teachers were providing them what they needed as far as um, going who to go to and speak with, which phone calls to make, and you know, those sort of things, giving them names and numbers, and in some cases actually physically taking them to these people. And what we found out is that the stress level of their teachers <coughs> was so high because they were taking, literally taking it home with them. And, um, so we had to have conversations about it's okay to coach them and give them, you know, make your next appointment during the day so that they, you could be there when they make the phone calls and actually coach the parents and how to access what they needed. But we also had the conversation about choices within the family and that maybe some choices they were making were not uh, sustaining the family. On, and that just sounds kind of mean to say, but you know, they may not have food, but they had Dish Network, or they had, you know. Um, so we, we did a lot of, we, we built that into our curriculum about good choices and, and how to look at budgets and choosing the appropriate things to sustain your family. And it has helped tremendously. We took that further and we started choosing families and asking them to mentor other families 
so that we could step back. Mm -hmm. So then, and they uh, they agreed to mentor, they agreed to be the point person so that they could make the phone calls with the families and then we could go back to teaching. So part of solving that problem was creating a sustainable practice, something exactly. that could be done over time with folks. And we've actually been at it for about three years and it, it was very difficult for your teachers uh, or our staff members that go into the families, go into the homes. So we, we actually did a progress monitoring rubric so that they could see mm -hmm. what they were doing, which was going to be my question about the other counties. You know, do you have a progress monitoring rubric? But they could actually see the positive growth trend mm -hmm. so that they were feeling better about it because they literally were going home in tears. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, sure. Anybody else? So, um, I learned from my partners here that there's a new policy that's going into effect to um, uh, register community college applicants to prove residency. And it's brand new, and it sounds like there it's a hot topic. There are maybe pros and cons. And so from policy to practice, there needs to be some uh, sort of analysis of how this is working, what are the pluses and what are the and so um, it's a mandate for the legislature to centralize residency. So we're working with our UNC partners as well as the community colleges. And it looks great on paper, but the piece that we're running against or having pushback is the technology piece, uh, how to bridge all that together. So we do, as students come into our colleges, we take the application, we do that intake, and then certain pieces of that application ask about residency and that information is then supposed to be downloaded to a central location and that's where there's a disconnect there. Not all that information is being, is a, being able to download based on the CFI application or CFNC application that, we, that students are, are requested to fill out. So we were supposed to go live this early spring. It's not happening yet. <laughs> but so. But you're doing the work because the policy's in place. Exactly. Uh, so there's a policy there that drives that work. Right. Uh, and for a lot of us, that's how things happen. Somebody passes a policy, and at first we might grumble and complain about it. Uh, some policies, not all of them, but some. But ultimately, it leads to, to practice. It, it, we have to get to there. So it helps us create a, a, a systematic or a pro practice or process that gets us there. Seamless, yeah, that's yeah. the intent is a seamless process because you know our colleges, our students apply to multiple campuses. And so just to have that residency resolved at one central location will benefit the student, of course, but it's the technology piece that we're still battling And again, I'm assuming that takes some collaboration with other people to make that Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? There were a lot of people talking. Um, I'll add one that, that I shared. As you know, we've had really a strong policy history of establishing 100% faculty schools. We're starting at the local school level and then passing legislation and then fully implementing it. But there's another sort of maybe circle around this diagram here where context changes. And now we've got e cigarettes. And all, they're not regulated. A lot of kids, a lot of parents say, don't worry, mom, it's just water vapor. Um, they don't understand that this may be a harmful product. They don't understand it's a tobacco product, which the legislature has confirmed that these cigarettes are a tobacco product. And so we have to update our implementation of our tobacco reuse policy with this new product out there. So it's always a, a constantly moving process, uh, moving back and forth. But because we have those two things in place, if we have a strong policy, or if we have practices that lead us to creation of a policy, it helps us get from one place to the other. You know, one of the reasons that I, I bring this up is a lot of the work that our schools and our school health advisory committees or SHACs were doing previously when we were doing the eight component model is, and they, they still are, that's not a bad thing, but they would come in and say, yeah, we got a small grant to do this, to do, I always pick on fuel up to play 60, but it's the one that comes to my head. And, and that's a great program, but after that, and when the money goes away, it's done. And so what we're really working with with the pilots is to get to a place where folks create sustainable practices, maybe even develop policies locally at their local board of ed that help them sustain the work over a longer period of time. Uh, because if we just start with 
the low hanging fruit is great, but at some point we've got to move beyond the low hanging fruit to address the data, which we're going to talk about the data in just a second. Any others before we move on? Uh, I'll give a few more in a minute, but just a little over, just a brief overview of the pilots. Just a reminder: these are our pilot districts. So far, they're all still with us, which is good. Um, and given that we asked them to collect these risk behavior survey data, and some of them learned how that's a lot. Uh, it's been good. Uh, so these are the folks that we're working with at this point. A little, uh, you can see them more geographically on the map uh, this way. Uh, Interestingly, they're all volunteer, but they do represent a reasonably diverse area of the state. I realize they're not any far west or far east, but uh, from a volunteer standpoint, it was nice to have uh, folks spread out a little bit. Um, just a review of the requirements that we ask these folks to do uh, and to be part of. Uh, they have to be willing to collect youth risk behavior survey data. And we were very fortunate that the Centers for Disease Control agreed to oversample all 11 of those LEAs in order to get county level data. And that's no easy task and I will give a shout out to Les Spell, our data and policy consultant, because he was just hired and he didn't realize, I'm telling him how it wasn't too hard to do YRDS. Uh, and it's not when you're just doing a state sample, but when you suddenly are doing another, an additional 12 to 15 LEA samples and uh, having to get that data, it becomes quite a challenge, but, but we're getting it, and I think we're going to get there. I think I just asked Les today, we have all the pilots except maybe one have almost completed the U.S. <coughs> behavior survey in their counties, which is great, and it's good because the end of the year is here, <laughs> and we need that now. Um, they have to have commitments from their local health department director and their superintendent, and those include attending all district level school health advisory council meetings. Uh, not sending a representative, but having someone who can make decisions sitting at the table. Uh, and also that they review data regularly and use it to prioritize action steps. And in a few minutes I'm going to ask Les to talk a bit more about what kind of data we're looking at. Uh, engaging other key leaders. Based on that data, who else needs to be at the table? It's one of the things that we've done kind of progressively with this group, is that we started and I'm like, oh, I remember saying to my oh, and Nichols needs to be at this table, and then Sally needs to be at this table, and as we start thinking about who needs to be here, what kind of representation needs to be in our local communities as well. Uh, the local board of ed has to commit to a three-year implementation of the pilot, um, and I've been told that's a long time in the school district world, so uh, we're happy to have that, that three years. Uh, there will be a partnership agreement that is, has been final, or is being finalized, and uh, when we go out to meet with the districts, uh, over the summer and in the fall, we'll be sharing that uh, partnership agreement with them. Um, their school, they have to have a district level school health advisory council and they have to meet at least quarterly and be working on two priority areas at any one time. And we'll talk about how to get to those. Uh, they have to designate someone at the district level to coordinate the pilot and serve as a primary contact. While the superintendent needs to be engaged, we realize they're incredibly busy and so we need a contact with the district that can be our go-to person to talk to about work. They have to identify um, a data contact. Most of the time that's the same person. Sometimes it's a, a data person from the, from the district. Um, and then the superintendent or, or designated whole pilot, pilot coordinator needs to attend at least one meeting uh, and some webinar and planning calls. And we've already had that annual meeting. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then um, they have to submit a success story because we want to share both with the board, the state board and with all of you some of the great work that's going on with districts, and we're going to share a little of that today to give you some ideas. So here's how it looks. Uh, we started with the pilot districts in January. We got everyone on board. Um, then we began, our staff uh, and my, our team began visiting districts, and we have uh, at the time five of us, and we all divided up those districts and went and, did, and began doing site visits with them, just to get to know folks at that point. What's your district like? How's it made up? Uh, in March, we began Youth Risk Behavior Survey implementation. Uh, again, we should have that information back. Um, one of the interesting things about YRBS data is that in order to get data that is representative of the entire district, you have to have a certain percentage return rate. So we're working really hard to clean up um, our data and make sure it, it gets counted. Um, then we had a state level uh, SHAC meeting. And we invited all shacks from all 115 LEAs to come to the meeting. We held it in Greensboro, the Laughlin uh, Education Center. 
Uh, we had vendors there. We also talked about data quite a bit, and we had sessions so that all shacks got resources that they might need. The second day, on April 4th, we met just with the pilots to go over the requirements of the pilot uh, in a little more detail. Um, we are working right now, between now and the fall, to have uh, our pilots go over the assessment tool, and they'll begin action planning and implementation in early the next school year, so September. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of where we are now. <coughs> One of the things that we, we talked about earlier is that there, uh, everybody needs to assess. It has to be data-driven decisions. We can't just guess. Because that's what, and that's easy. We say, yeah, this sounds fun. Let's do this. I, I worked in employee wellness for a really long time, and or not a long time, but it was uh, intense work. And oftentimes I would go in and say, we need to do a needs assessment. And if you're in a company, uh, I remember it was Sarah Lee. I walked in and they said, oh no, we know what our employees want. We want to have an aerobics program here, and we want to have this. And I'm like, well, but what does your data say about your employees? What do they need? What are how many folks are getting treated for diabetes or, or heart disease? And let that help us drive our decision making. What the employees want is important, but also what they need is important if we're going to make success, if we're going to be successful with our work. So we have worked long and hard. Uh, we included, uh, actually, this work started uh, with Thomasville. Um, Thomasville <laughs> City Schools, even before we started the pilot, came to us and said, we really want to measure this work. Let's do it. Um, and um, Dr. Faison's here, Mary Jane will be here a little bit uh, to help talk a little bit about Thomasville's work. But we sat down together and started thinking about all the different data sources we had that we could use for assessing what districts are doing. But it had to be data that most districts had accessibility to. So we chose several different measures and we created a tool for our schools to use. And when Les walks through it, it's going to look long. But it's not. It is. It's long one time. But once you get the numbers in, then it's just about updating them and seeing if you're making changes and, and using that data to decide where you want to work. Can't do everything all at once. So I'm going to ask Les to give, to just walk us through a little bit of that. And I'm going to, as long as everybody can hear me, I'm going to do it from here because i got to be able to drive. So we took the whole child model, the whole school, community whole child model, and looked at all of the different uh, components, the, the 10 components of coordinated school health, which are the blue ones going around the circle and the other components that are also on the inside of the circle and we try to find data measures oh, no. well just help just okay you don't have to leave. oh so she just told you about the assessment tool so for each one of the components of coordinated school health we created a spreadsheet and um, this is the way it looks so this is our Google Sheet, uh, the assessment tool. The first thing that we have here, the first page or the first sheet that's part of it, is the LEA summary page. This was, um, we didn't initially have this, and it was a great idea from our pilots when we got together and talked with them. They said, we want to have a page where if we go and share our data with the other pilots, the other districts, we want to be able to look and see what does this district look like. Uh, because they wanted to be able to compare themselves to a district that is similar to themselves, which made perfect sense. So we created the LEA summary page where they can input uh, information about their county and then information specific to their LEA, such as this. And you'll see the one, the data that you're going to see today, Thomasville uh, City Schools volunteered to share uh, what they had, and I've gone in and actually filled in some things that they, they didn't have that um, Mary Jane had uh, sent to us. Uh, earlier. Uh, so you can see this, the number of elementary schools in Thomasville, middle schools, high schools, and then what their enrollment is, the percentage of economically disadvantaged students we're going to fill in, the graduation rate, etc. Et mm -hmm. So down at the bottom, we just click on health education, and you can see we've got a handful of measures for each of the components of coordinated school health. And a lot of our measures are coming from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which was uh, one of the reasons they had to agree to conduct the um, oversample for the youth risk behavior survey was to be able to have numbers to put in here. When they, when a LEA enters their data into the spreadsheet, it automatically color codes. If they don't have anything, then it's not applicable, or they leave it blank, then it stays this way. If their number is higher or lower, depending on what the measure is, if it's um, 
that they're not doing as well as what the state average is, <coughs> then it will light up in red and then it brings a little attention to it while they're doing it. If they're doing better, then it lights up in green. Just kind of color code it just to make it uh, easy for them. And I'm not going to talk about a whole lot of the health education ones because there's, I know Mary Jane, when she does her presentation about Thomasville, is going to talk about one of those and I don't want to. Um, spoil that for her. Uh, <clears throat> she's also picked one from nutrition, but as you can see here, uh, examples of the measures we're asking for is what is the percentage of students who ate breakfast all seven days. Uh, you can see Thomasville, this is based on their 2015 data, which was the, the last time that the YRPS was done. It's done on an odd number of years, every two years. And in 2015, uh, when Thomasville conducted their own uh, youth risk behavior survey, they selected their own questions and they did not include the question uh, that asked about this on their local survey. So this was another reason why the pilots had to agree to do the youth risk behavior survey and to use our questionnaire so that we're consistent and we're able to get numbers from each question. So when 2017 results are done, they will be able to fill in anywhere that you see a, a not available or not applicable. So I'm going to go, there's physical education, physical activity. Uh, a lot of this comes from the Healthy Active Children Report. Um, oh, this is a good thing to point out. On each of these, there is a place for a local data measure. For, for each of the components, there's a place for the, the pilots to put in something that's <coughs> Uh, specific to their area or that they're particularly interested in or that they have data on that maybe we haven't thought about and since this is a pilot uh, that's going to be great when, after three years or even after this first go around when they filled it out this summer and fall once they get it done the first time and we're able to look at it if we can find some some common measures that were selected at the local level then we may go back and add that in as one of our required measures um, so that's that's a added thing. All right, health services. I want to point out one measure here: the school nurse to student ratio for Thomasville. You can see it was at one to six hundred, and the uh, I think that's I'm not sure they have one in each school. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how that worked out for them. Which is actually the state recommendation is that we have one in each school. You can see the um, statewide our number is one to one school nurse for every one thousand one hundred twelve. Uh, students. Um, we'll skip ahead. Just I, like she said, this is long, and I know you don't want me to go through every single measure, so I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. If there's anything you have a question about, feel free to stop me. Uh, the counseling, psychological, and social services component. Uh, we, we're looking at things such as the school counselor to student ratio, the social worker to student ratio, the recommended school psychologists, etc. Um, the next component we have the social and emotional climate. Uh, a couple of things under social and emotional climate, one of the things we're looking at is the rate of short-term suspensions. And this is from the latest 2015-16 uh, DPI uh, report. You can see when Thomasville's number was at 39.94 or every 100 students versus the state result of 19.6. Now, I know, because I've looked at the data, the 39.94 is, is an improvement over what they've had in the last couple of years. And as we do, as the members of the pilot do this for the next three years, they'll be able to see that on paper, whether they're going up or going down. Question. Do you only look at that for high school students? Yes, that, for that one in particular is for high school. The suspension rate down here is for K-12. Uh, this this particular number is just it's a measure that came from our report and was easy it was easy to pull it may be that we go in and add another measure that is what would you suggest K12 or I would K8 or I would strongly suggest you look at like pre-K through elementary age groups because that is setting when you're thinking of whole child and setting the stage for success right. down the road. We, that's a place that um, can be very problematic. Um, you're right. And then, and, then, and I'm, I'm thinking right along with you, as soon as you're saying that, I'm like, it's clicking in my head. I'm like, that's where we got to cut it off because that's where the patterns start. Kids start getting in trouble in elementary school. And then it, the, it's usually the same kids. I've talked 
elementary school, high school, and middle school. And it's usually the same kids that are in trouble in elementary, they're in trouble in middle school, they're in trouble. So, yeah, we need to, be, we need to add that in. Well, one of the things about this, a lot of the data, because we have high school data available, we can also yes. look at that data and say, wow, we've got a problem in high school. We definitely need to go back and address these issues in, in lower grades. Even if, if, if we have the data available, and like we said, any district can put any local it's measures they want, yeah, that we have available. Uh, we went with what we knew we had available on right. all, across all levels, but local districts can put in any data they want to go with it. So they can put in their data related to younger students on many of these. And can I ask one other question? Sorry. Sure. Is is chronic absenteeism one of the data points you're looking at? Yeah, the, the um, attendance attendance rate is, is one of our numbers, yes. So I'd encourage you to look at that also by age by elementary versus right. That's the question. So the short term suspensions, does that um, that eliminate the ones that were suspended for immunization noncompliance or is everybody lumped together? Because I would say that's a totally separate issue. I think they may be lumped together. Yeah. But particularly when you're looking at the elementary grades and uh, if the numbers are a lot smaller, it would be very mm -hmm. important to know whether that was disciplinary right. or immunization mm -hmm. related. <laughs> right, and, and there has been a request that has been made um, in writing um, in one of our toolkits that we sent out to school districts that there is a certain code that is used for uh, suspensions due to immunizations, but we need to ensure everyone is using that code. Otherwise, they do fall into the, to the group that you have na named, so yes. All right, so under physical environment, we've got a, a few to start with here. Uh, the percentage of students who carried a weapon on them uh, in the past 30 days. And then we have another uh, statistic from our DPI report, the report of crime rates. And uh, the aging years of the um, main instructional building, that's something that we're, we're trying to get a, 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 you know, be able to pinpoint that down. That's, that's difficult at times. Um, it's great information though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it tells a lot about the environment. I know that my high school, I, when I say my high school, I mean my high school. And I talk, I talk about, <laughs> I, I live in Sampson County. I still live two miles from Hopton High School. And uh, it was built in 1956. We still have the signs up on the wall in the hallway to say asbestos is in the ceiling. Please don't stretch it. You know, so, oh so that is a factor when you talk about the physical environment. Um, Employee wellness. Under employee wellness, we look at the total. I've changed this. We did have total total teacher turnover rate, but that terminology has changed just this year. And the report from from us from DPI is now the total teacher attrition rate, which takes into account teachers who leave an LEA to go to another LEA, and teachers who leave education altogether, and it's broken apart into the two categories, and the number that's there is those two numbers put together. Um, the other things we're looking at here is percentage of schools that provide staff wellness programs, and you see Thomasville is 100%, um, and then schools that have tobacco cessation services. Next one, family engagement. Uh, the one I have highlighted here is parent serves as a member of the health committee slash advisory group. Thomasville is 100% on that, for sure. Um, next one, you can tell me if I need to. Okay. Because <laughs> I can go for days on this. All right. The, the, last, part, the last part here, this, this tab is uh, the academic measures. This is not a part of the whole school, whole community, whole child uh, model. It's not one of the components that was pulled out of that and pulled measures. This are, these are academic measures. So uh, this is something that everyone agreed once you're looking at how all these things are affecting uh, the health of the kids or the students, then we want to look at how their academics are related to that. And then over time, we should be able to see as we're making improvements in these other areas, we would expect to see improvements in the areas of academics. Uh, so we have several, this is where the attendance comes in. And you can see what the attendance rate is, high school dropout rate. Um, so I did note when I was when I was researching this that 
Thomas Field, there, I, when I see stuff in red, I try to go and find out what's something good about that. Um, <coughs> because it, it, it strikes me bad. But um, Thomasville last year, 2014-15, was at 5.15%. And they represent, they're one of the three LEAs with the largest three-year decrease in high school dropout rates. So they went from 5.15 on the 2015 report to 2.49 on the 2016 report. And that's something that, as they fill these out and they got it year to year, it's just another measure to be able to look at it and they can see where progress is being made or where areas they need to work on. So that, in a nutshell, is the assessment tool. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So is the data also disaggregated? Because this can, you know, this can really mask, when you're just looking at the whole populations that may not actually be seeing improvement. So uh, this is not going to be a perfect tool. It, it yeah, won't yeah. tell you everything. That, that's part of why you have a school health advisory council. It'll have to okay. sit around and say, here's what our data says. Here's what we okay. know. We know that this subgroup really needs more help. So we can't use our overall data. Maybe we need to focus here. I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of we can't get a tool that's going to capture that. That's going to have to be a conversation. And that's why that school health advisory committee has to be together and meet and talk about what does this data say to them. Because what it might say is not what it says to less. I mean, he tries to find out answers because he's curious like that, but he's not in each LEA. The folks sitting there at the table have to say, here's what we know about why that's that way. It's that um, context circle. Yeah. Right. You brought up on that we can't capture. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad that we're including educational achievement you know, mm -hmm. in the assessment because, of course, that's the, I guess, primary objective of the school. And, you know, looking at this model, these are kind of all the things that need to be in place so the child can learn and show up, you know, ready to learn, and, but um, doesn't really talk about how we're going to teach the child. And so, you know, looking at end of grade achievement and those sorts of things kind of brings the whole educational component into it. I think the mantra of our work for years has been healthy children learn better, and we finally have national data, we finally have research data that supports that work, but it's getting to, to schools to, to use their data and see some of that movement as well, and then I think it, it makes it easier. It's tough, because everybody talks about whole child, but then when the rubber hits the road and it's time to buy in, it gets t tougher for folks, because like, well, but testing's next week, you know, and, and so really taking making that commitment, and that's what we're asking these 11 LEAs to do, is make that commitment to make this a priority, uh, and I think while any L all LEAs in the state will be working on this, this is a commitment we've asked for for these folks to show what kind of difference it does make. So. Um, this may be a longer conversation for later, but I'm, I'm kind of curious about the questions that were being asked about suspension and sort of sorting out that data. And I know when we were first implementing the tobacco free schools policy, we tried to work really hard to create an alternative to suspension because we wanted kids to come together, stay in school. If they got out on the street, they were likely to smoke more. Are there other, are there other programs going on in school systems that give yes. kids an alternative to yes. suspension? Yeah, there are, a lot of our districts have academies or other kinds of, but so when schools, students have a short-term suspension, they actually still go to school. Uh, they go to a different place, but they go to school and they are still getting instruction. So they're not missing instruction because they're suspended from the, in the building. It's a structured day a program. Structured day program. Alternative learning program. Yeah. So you can get, get you an idea of where we are right now. Our team has been working hard. I want to again uh, just say introduce you again to Kelly Langston. Uh, she will be transitioning into our, uh, she's actually been doing work already. She's uh, so committed. Uh, and transitioning into our whole school, whole community, whole child, or our whole child <laughs> consultant to help us do this work. Um, we found out that as much as our team is, we all have other jobs too, and we've been trying to pick it up, and it's nice to have a person that kind of can bring this all in a central location for us and help us help us do this work. So as she rotates out of her PTA role, she'll be rotating into more uh, a more um, permanent role with us, so we're looking looking forward to that. So the next move will be to get some, um, let folks tell you about the work they're doing, but before we do that, it's hot and you need a break. So why don't we take uh, about 10 minutes and uh, restrooms are straight out here uh, and there's a sign that says restrooms if you want to follow out there.
And uh, then we'll be back in 10 minutes. Yeah, 25 after. Let's do that. Hey, hurry in. Can I stop this real quick? Uh, <laughs> 